Hi, everyone. Thank you. So like uh, Dr. Sapersky said, this will be just the flip side of what he talked about. When we have a, a good idea, a clear idea of what's going on, how do we make these decisions, actually, to put us on the path that we want to be? Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. So first, you know, we're talking a lot about driving today. Let's stay, stick to the topic and just, uh, here's a question for you. You don't have to raise your hand. Do you think you're a good driver? Do you think you're like, for those of you who drive, you're above average? You're about average or you're below average as a driver? So I think I'm above average. And so many studies have been done asking this type of question. The number of people who say they're above average is up to 90%. 90% of drivers say they're above average drivers. So, okay, we, we see something's going on here. They've actually asked all types of questions, and many researchers did, and there's actually this overconfidence effect that we have going on. They would ask people some kind of question, and only 40% 40 people, 40 of the people would actually be correct, but 90% of the people thought they were correct. So again, you know, our intuition, that's kind of what it does to us. And so how good are we at making decisions? Like we're probably not as good as we think. And so that's why we're going to talk about some of the same strategies to help us make better decisions. We're going to look at how our minds make decisions. We're going to revisit system one and system two again. I know a couple of people came in a bit late for that piece. And look at tools to help us make better decisions to harness really the way our mind actually works. Not how we think it works, but the way that scientifically, you know, it's been proven it works. So let's start with a little exercise. If you have a pen and paper, write it down, or just give some thought to some decisions you're, you're thinking of making in your, in your future. And kind of where are you leaning? Where do you think this decision is going to go? Like my decision is I have a car that's kind of, I'm not sure, maybe it's time to replace it. It's starting to break down a little but maybe it's good enough. Maybe I just fix it up a little and it's gonna work. I'm really not sure where I'm gonna go with that. So think about what kind of decisions are coming up in your future, and we're gonna think about them a little later. Okay. So let's put that aside and let's kinda of take a step back. What are decisions all about? We have the past, we have the future, and we have the present. So in the present is where we make our decisions to move to the future. But we, it's just, you know, we have to look to the past, we have to look for, to the future. So when we look to the past, we see two things. We see what really happened in the past. You know, my car broke down, or you know, my friend was upset when I was five minutes late to meet her. You know, the next day she was 20 minutes late. You know, what happened? And then how did I think and feel about it? How did you think and feel about it? So kind of the event that happened, it's on the outside. And then in our minds, we have our thoughts and feelings. And they're both very important, but they're also separate. In our minds, it's, it can be hard to separate them a little bit. You know, yeah, like I might think, you know, my friend was really mad, but was she really mad? Was she mad the previous time, but not last time? Was I expecting her to be mad, but she really wasn't? And so it's worth a little effort to separate them what really happened, and then how do we feel about it, what do we think happened. What about the future? The future, I mean, it's exciting. You know, that's where, you know, we have hopes, we have dreams, we want things, we plan things, hopefully we're gonna get the things we want and that we plan. You know, where do we wanna go? And we can experiment with different futures and kind of experimentation, something that came up in the previous uh, presentation is, you know, we can do mental experiments around what we want. You know, I can imagine, you know, I'm gonna get a new car, you know, spend lots of money, what's that gonna do to me? You know, I'm gonna fix up the current car, I'm just gonna take my chances and, you know, hope I make it to the next place I'm going. I can experiment all that without leaving the room, you know? I can daydream, you know, just like, you know, sit, you know, have a cup of tea and experiment in my mind. And we wanna make sure that our decisions move us from the present into the future. So it's, good, it's important to have a good idea of what that is. And I know some of us have really kind of goals, really set our long-term goals. Not all of us do. But we can always in the moment think of, you know, where do I, where do I want to go now? You know, where do I want to be two years from now? Where do I want to be 10 minutes from now? That's also a future, right? 10 minutes in the future. You know, 10 minutes in the future, I'll still be standing here. <laughs> 
So what is a good decision? How do we know it was a good decision? You know, did it take us to the future? It really depends. Sometimes it's like, you know, I bought a new car and it broke down a week later. That is the worst decision I ever made. And really, that's not, it wasn't necessarily a bad decision. You know, it depends on how the decision was made. If I thought about it, if I experimented in my mind, I shopped around, I looked up my budget, you know, it was probably a good decision. I cannot control all the things that happen outside of, you know, I can't control everything. I can control the process. I can control how I made the decision. And that makes a good decision. Other things might happen, and it can still be a good decision with a terrible outcome, right? And so we want to look also at the probability, use up, you know, think about probability to make a better decision. So like if I buy a new car, like another car, what is the probability that it will break a week later? You know, it's really slim. It's probably not going to happen. You know, we buy something new, we expect it to last. You know, however, if my car broke down, you know, three times in the last month, what are the chances that it will break down again if I don't do something about it? They are very high. So we look at how we make the decision. So it can be a, bad, a good decision even if bad outcomes happen. So we want to just really be confident in how we go through it. So next, I'm just going to do a quick review of the system one and system two that we talked about you know, earlier this evening. So because this really affects, again, not only how we assess our environment, but how we make our decisions. So we talked about system one being an autopi autopilot and working all the time, and system two being intentional, taking a little more work. System one being subconscious and automatic, really fast. System two being conscious, slow, using logic. And so they kind of play off of each other, but they're pretty different. Again, system two is our sense of self. So when I think like, what is my self? What are my intentional values, beliefs? What kind of person do I want to be? That's usually you know, system two, the intentional part. Uh, we have to choose to pay attention with system two. System one's always on. You know, we don't have to worry about that. And system one has our automatic thoughts and feelings, our assumptions, our beliefs, where we talked about you know, the airplane might be dangerous. That's you know, on our autopilot. If we stop and think about it, it might be safer than a car. <coughs> Uh, we talked about how system one is like the elephant and system two, the elephant rider on top of it, trying to get it to go places. You know, it can be a bit of work, but we can train the elephant and we can train the elephant rider. Uh, so again, we talked about how system one uses not a lot of energy at all. It runs all the time. That makes it very efficient. You know, we can't have system two run all the time. We'll be exhausted thinking through things. So it's kind of in a low effort, low power mode all the time. We have to activate it, activate it in order to kind of turn to our reason and overcome some of our kind of assumptions and things that might be steering us wrong. Here are some of the times that system two is activated. System one runs into difficulty. You know, something's not quite right. You know, what are some examples that something might not be quite right? You know. Uh, say I expected, you know, my friend to come by himself. He comes with like three other friends. I'm like, what? That, that, that's not what was supposed to happen. You know, when we're learning from inform you information, like right now, you all are. You know, hopefully your system two is engaged and you're not just like, I know what she's going to say next. You know, and awareness of potential for error. You know, when we're taking a test, when we're in a new situation, say when we were driving in a new place. When you're driving in a place, you know, you probably come here all the time. You're on autopilot driving here. You're driving to a new place. You're, you know, you kind of where you might take a long, wrong turn. So system two is engaged. Uh, and again, just to review kind of the framework of the implications, like what does this all mean? It means that while we're often right on our autopilot, the errors do happen. They happen about 20% of the time. The emotional issues are really prone to error where our emotions are concerned and the probability. And again, system two is the intentional part. They can intervene, they can take over, it can be turned on, can correct for some of these errors. But we really do need to, like, to make an effort of it. It doesn't happen you know, on its own, because it's, it takes a lot of work. So predictable errors, uh, we've just talked about some predictable errors that affect how we observe reality. We're gonna look at a couple of more 
that affect how we make decisions. So these are some predictable errors that affect how we make decisions. The first one, let's just say it's wishful thinking. It's wishful thinking that I'm going to you know, study for my exam starting the night before my exam. I have done that multiple times when I was in college. I regretted it every time, but I still did it. I'm not proud to say it. You know, why, you know, what could possibly make me think, it was not a logical decision. You know, I can write that paper in two days. That, no, I could not write that paper in two days. That was not a good paper. And, but it was wishful thinking. Like, I think I can do it. I think that everything is gonna go perfectly according to plan. That if I have six hours to write a paper, and it takes me six hours to write it, it's totally going to work. But of course, no, I have to go to the bathroom, take a nap, you know, I have to eat something, you know, my, someone calls me on the phone, I have to take out the trash, feed the cat, you know, that's not six hours anymore, that's four hours, right? So we don't really plan for the extra time, we don't plan for the extra resources because our system one just thinks everything's gonna go fine, everything's just gonna work. You know, driving someplace, uh, that's like another problem I have. I'm like, I'm 30 minutes away, my appointment is at 1 o'clock, or my class is at 1 o'clock or whatever. When do I have to leave? 12.30. But I have to park. Maybe I have to look for parking. I have to walk to the place. You know, what does it mean if I leave at 12.30? Does that mean I'm in the car, or I'm walking out of the house, or I'm putting on my shoes? Next thing you know, I'm 10 minutes late, like almost every day. And so my mind's not doing me any favors. It's, you know, it's like sabotaging me. And I mean, I bet that happens. That happens to others, right? Okay, good. <laughs> it's not just me. You know, it's not just me. And it's, it's really, it's been shown, it's been researched that it happens to so many of us. And the funny thing is that research shows that it happens like, I'm going to leave late for my meeting in, in half an hour. But if you're leaving, I'm going to tell you, you should leave an extra 15 minutes for that. Like, I'm realistic about others and I'm pessimistic. I'm not hopeful, but about myself, oh, sure, it's going to work. So there's something, something's wrong up here for all of us. One example of uh, research, it was first proposed back in 1979. That's the year I was born. This information has been around for a little while. Daniel Kahneman and Emma Tversky, they uh, surveyed some students. They said, how long do you think it will take you to write your thesis paper? You know, if everything goes perfectly, if everything is like really goes south, or like on average, you know, under average circumstances. So on average, what did they say? 34 days. If everything goes perfectly, 27 days. If everything really goes very poorly, up to 48 days to complete this paper. When the students actually did it, on average, it took them 55 days. So that's on average much more than the most like, you know, conservative estimate. It took them much longer. And most of them didn't complete it in the time they said. And they kind of, they probably thought that everything would go according to plan. So, you know, how has this helped me? You know, what has it done for me? I leave the house on time more often. You know, I got here on time today. But that's only because instead of, you know, I added like 40 minutes to the time it took me to actually drive here. You know, because I know that when my mind thinks it's time to leave, in actuality, that's like the time for me to put on my shoes, to get my bag, to go to the car, to this, that. And so even if I'm like 40 minutes that I'm late, I'm, I'm on time. So I really had to like switch how I do things. And I'm on time more often, so I'm kind of proud of that. Uh, so that's, you know, wishful thinking. So planning fallacy is the official word if you want to like uh, look it up on Google or something and look for actual research that psychologists did. It's called planning fallacy. What's the next one we're going to look at? It's, the official name is sunk cost fallacy, but the quick way to remember it is throwing good money after bad. And that's something we kind of hear. It's like a you know, common wisdom. And it really alerts us to something that we actually do this all the time. When we're really, you know, when we invested a lot into getting something, whether it's money or time or some kind of resource, we tend to be reluctant to give it up. You know, you know, I'm fixing, you know, I don't know, I'm building something like a DIY project, like maybe I, you know, some furniture. I'm going to paint it and make it all new. And I painted it and it didn't come out. I'm like, okay, I'm going to sand it. I will paint it again. You know, I will tape it up. And at what, the more I do it, the harder it is to give it up. I'm like, I'm all, it's almost done. You know, a week later, maybe it's time to give up. 
maybe it's just time to give up. Maybe it's just, you know, but the system one is just so invested. It's just really hard, really hard to let go. You know, another thing that I experienced is I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. There's a lot of public transportation. And I would take the bus. I would take the, I would walk to the bus and take the bus to the train, like to get what I was, where I was going and you know, to high school or to college. And sometimes the bus is just not there when it's supposed to be. You know, it's supposed to be here two minutes ago and you're standing this little schedule, seven minutes, 10 minutes, the next bus is not here. At some, time, at some point I have to decide to do something different. You know, catch a cab to the train station or like do something. You know, go block over to look for another bus. But it's so hard. It's like, well, I already, it's just gonna come in a minute. I've been already here 12 extra minutes. Like another, another minute, another, it's so hard to let go because I feel I already gave, I invested so much. And you know, so that's kinda, it's, it's a problem. It really traps us in a decision that may, may not be good for us. It really prevents us from kinda looking what else might be out there. It prevents us from considering our options. Like I feel guilty throwing out this furniture that didn't work that I messed up, right? So that's what we call a sunk cost fallacy. And actually that's something that happens to the best of us and the smartest, you know, politicians, you know, they make a decision. You know, we just talked about updating our beliefs. They might not update their beliefs based on new information. They might be invested, you know, uh, military conflicts is a time to pull out. Or are we gonna win? We're gonna win in a few months. We're gonna come ahead. So it's really something that happens to individuals at all, you know, of all, of all, of all stripes. So, you know, I really, to me, sunk cost fallacy, throwing good money after bad, you know, throwing time after time is wasted, it really gave me the freedom. You know, sometimes it's okay. You know, I cook the dish, I failed, I followed the recipe, I failed, I feel like I still have to eat it. Because it's, I spent all this time and money, but you know, I can't get that back. There's no way to get back the time, the money I spent on the ingredients is just gone. It's sad. I mean, it's really sad, but it's true. You know, we want to be honest with ourselves. So whether or not I spent all that time, should I just get takeout? Should I eat it anyway? Like I should, re we should reevaluate our options like from, you know, ground zero. So what are we doing at that point? Maybe I don't feel like going for takeout and I will still eat it because it's not so horrible. And that's fine, but we should be free to make that decision. But sometimes we're just trapped, like I have to eat it, it doesn't matter. I have to learn my lesson or I don't know, whatever. So throwing good money after bad, it kind of keeps us trapped in a decision that might not be good for us. And another third and uh, final uh, of these predictable errors that affect our decisions that we're gonna look at today is Fancy word is hyperbolic discounting. But really, you know, you've heard this, maybe you have, I thought it's cute, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. So kind of do and party, you know, I'd rather die, you know, drunk, fat, and happy. You know, when we think about it, I, no, I don't want to drive, die fat, drunk, and happy. No, I want to have a long, healthy life and accomplish things, I think. You know, I want to do things. But in reality, a lot of the decisions we intuitively make, we actually make them like this is what we believe without thinking about it. We prefer smaller payoffs now, eat and drink and celebrate, over larger payoffs later, you know, reaching our goals, being healthy, uh, and that's what's called hyperbolic discounting. So we prefer, you know, I would prefer $10 now over, you know, $20 in a month. And they've done a lot of research about this. You know, some of the uh, folks, Shane Frederick, David Lapson, and others, there's you know, a lot of cognitive science research and it's really, really bizarre that we prefer something that our mind just thinks that right now is so much more important than later. That's the reason why folks have trouble saving. You know, say oh, my retirement is so much later, I don't care, I need the money now. I need that new car. You know, I wanna go out and have a good life. By the time retirement comes up, it's far, far away, you know. And here's an interesting fact, and a lot of this has to do with our health. Uh, this is from Johns Hopkins University out on the East Coast. And the CEO said that every year the number of people who have uh, heart surgery, the coronary artery bypass graft surgery, I mean, that just sounds really harsh, 
over half a million people every year due to heart disease have the surgery. So these are folks whose heart diseases can no longer be managed. They have a crisis. They have the surgery. And the doctors tell them, you know, right now, you have got to make these changes in your life. You know, you have not been eating a very healthy diet. You have not been doing a lot of exercise. You have not been active. I mean, you have surgery now. This might happen again. You might die. This is really a good time for you to kind of rethink your lifestyle. What is the percentage of people that actually make those choices and actually change how they live? Does anybody want to guess how many people actually do it? 10%. Very good. 10%. Huh? 10%. That's actually accurate. That's actually accurate. Nine out of 10 people do not make those hard choices. They do not adjust their diet. They do not become more active. Only 10% do. Just think about it. What if someone told you that you might die if you don't change your habits? You know, right now we're all thinking, like, I'm, I'm confident, I'm overconfident that I totally would. We all are, but it's, you know, easier said than done. And even in things, life and death matters. Life and death matters. This still gets the best of us, you know? So, what's, so healthy food choices. We talked early about, you know, cookies. You know, if I say next week, am I going to eat three slices of cake? I'm like, no, that's too much for one week. You know, if I'm in front of three slices of cake, my chances are pretty poor. <laughs> you know, when it's right there, it's so delicious. I'm like, I'll be better next week. So it's just really our system one, our intuitions, it's really doesn't estimate that very well. It doesn't take care of ourselves, you know, unless we intentionally do it. So another thing, you know, students here cramming for exams, that's also an example of hyperbolic discounting. You know, that's why I crammed for exams when I was in college. In grad school, I hate to say it, I did it too. I was just talking to Gleb when we were preparing this presentation. I'm still like embarrassed to think about this one project I did in about 36 hours before it was due. It's terrible. It's just sad. But why do we do it? Why didn't I start doing it earlier? Why don't we start studying earlier? Because it's like, oh, I'll study later. I have something to do now. It's still like a month, you know, two weeks until the exam. You know, the exam comes, oh, it's still like, you know, three days until the exam, I'll study later. It's like, oh, bummer, you know. <laughs> so it's really, it really undermines our decisions. Then the night the exam is due, we don't get enough sleep, we drink coffee, you know, not feeling well for the next two days, might not do very well in the exam. Why, why is it so hard to think of these things? But it really is. And so it kind of helps to know because it's just our human nature. You know, thankfully it's been researched and studied and we can, we can use it. So... Let's see, are there any questions right now? And we're gonna look at some strategies after this. Are there any, any questions at the moment? We're gonna take a little break for questions. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we're going to talk about it, but the, 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 the comment is like, do we need motivations? Like, what do, you, what do we need to do to ourselves? Part of it is, is we need to activate system two. We need to activate our, like, more reasonable side of our mind. And part of it, we do need to appeal to our, like, emotions, because emotions are what speak to us all the time, whether or not we are aware of it. And so that's really a part of it. So are there any, any questions? Are we going to move on to some of the strategies we have? So here are some strategies. The ones on the top, I think, are kind of really the big picture things that we can stick with. One is focus on your long-term goals. And the next one is reframe your perspective. And reframe your perspective is having the choice, having the power to believe something different, to expect something different, to really make a big choice and a big change in how we view things. And focusing on our long-term goals you know, if I just had heart surgery, my surgeon tells me, you really need to change your ways. And I'm like, but it's so hard and I don't feel like it. And no one in my family eats healthy and I don't have a place to exercise. And, you know, but if I think about my long-term goals, I want to stay alive. And I shift my perspective and say, I don't have to just be confined to my situation. You know, everyone in my family eats unhealthy. You know, I can get them, you know, maybe I can talk to them. I can get them to cook different foods. You know, if they don't listen, I can make sure to buy the foods that I need. 
Maybe I can eat only a portion of the foods that they eat or just eat less. You know, if there's no place to exercise, you know, maybe, you know, I can exercise in my room. Did you know that there are videos that you can watch a video and get like a half mile or a mile or two mile walk? And there's a video of an athlete just going like this and then she does little steps to the side and you can be in your living room just watching this and that's all she does. And in the end, she's like, you walk three miles. Three miles. I've read about uh, uh, a tractor trailer drivers who have notoriously you know, very poor health and difficult lifestyle. They're driving all the time under stress. They might not get a lot of sleep and they have huge, huge problems with their health. So some of them park their tractor trailer and walk around it. And if you walk a certain number of times, that's like half a mile or a mile. Or they bring you know, their cooler with ice and they lift it above their head for you know, weight training. And these are some of the ways that are kind of explained to them because you know, the companies want their drivers to be healthier. But it's just also an example that you don't have to be bound by your circumstances, oh, I sit all day. But there can be a change done. And on the other hand, some of the companies, they started installing little gyms, little workout spaces in the places where drivers, you know, take a break, take a shower. So we can reframe our perspective, you know. I'm always late, I'm always leaving, you know, just in the nick of time. If I just add 50, 20 minutes of time to every time I need to leave the house, I don't feel good about it. But because, I mean, I just know reality is such, I'm going to be 10 minutes late, I'm going to forget something, I'm going to be another five minutes late. Just add 20 minutes, put it in my calendar, and it works. So reframing your perspective, it can be hard. It's hard to be honest with ourselves. Um, so here are some other tips. Ask why and ask why not. Looking at that piece of cake, why do I want to eat it? Stop yourself. Why do I want to eat it? Because it's delicious. You know, or why do I not want to exercise? That was the example earlier. Why do I not want to exercise? Because it's just dull or I don't know. Maybe I'm embarrassed of myself in gym clothes. I don't know. There might be many reasons. But being honest with myself, it can really it can really be powerful instead of just like, oh, I don't want to think about it. grab cake, eat it. You know, like, why do I want to eat it? Because it's just delicious right now. But what about my long-term goals? How great am I going to feel if I don't eat it now? That can empower me. It can empower you, you know, to ask, why do we want to do it? Why are we, like, drawn to do it? Or why are we so averse to some kind of activity? And outside perspective is a really powerful, powerful thing. And that has to do with imagining someone else, you know, consult, you know, coaching you in the situation. It can be someone else like a trusted friend, or you can imagine, it can be an imaginary friend, that's fine. It can be, you know, a trusted person, you know, my friend doesn't live here, or, you know, maybe even, you know, my grandmother, she's no longer alive, but she always gave me good advice, like, what would she do? What would she say? You know, or I can be like, what would I say to myself? What would I say to a friend? like my friend who's always running late places, I would be like, just make believe you have to leave 20 minutes early. It's so easy to give advice to others, and it's so hard to fix ourselves. So if we think that we're giving advice to someone else, that kind of breaks through that, and then we end up giving ourselves good advice. So actually calling up a friend, that also works very well if you have someone you can ask, or a family member, or a mentor, or someone, and actually ask them, and they will be able to give you an honest feedback. Another cool trick with outside perspective Think of yourself in the future. An hour from now, my future me would feel not great about eating a slice of cake. You know, five years out, me will not feel so great. You know, it's going to look at back in time. Five years back, should have gone to the gym. Should have done it. Should have gone every other day. So what does our future us think? You know, it can be like 10 minutes from now. You know, I'm going to feel terrible if I eat that slice of cake right now. You know, I'm going to feel terrible if I say, you know, to, you know, to this guy what I really want to say. You know, so I want to be proud of myself in the future. So outside perspective, you can play with it many, other, many different ways, and it's really fun and flexible, and you really have no excuse. If your friend's not here or if you don't have someone to count on, you can imagine you're, you're talking to someone else. And be self-aware, the, the third one over here. That's very important. And uh, a little earlier, we talked about, like, oh, I notice I'm confused or I notice I'm surprised kind of situation. And they, this kind of, like, makes it broader. Be self-aware. Like, I'm aware that I'm always late. You know, if I'm always late, I can notice it. And if I'm honest with myself, I'm like, okay, 
it's a part of being self-aware. I offer, you know, if I am self-aware that, you know, I don't like certain situations and I don't handle them very well, like, like say I don't like talking on the phone. It's okay if I call, when someone calls and I just answer like, who is this? It's like, it's not good, it's not good. So I can prepare, I can let it ring a couple times and collect my thoughts because I know what's gonna happen, I know the future. It's happened 80 times before, it's gonna happen again. And I'm self-aware of this, you know, situation that I have. And we're all very different, you know, all of us are different. And so what, what's, you know, it's important to be aware of like, what are your peculiarities and your personality, you know. And so that's very empowering. Again, it's not easy to do, but it really gives us this key, this unique key that's shaped just like we are to, to help address our kind of challenges and to be better off. So these are some general strategies. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes, please. Couldn't focusing on a long-term goal end up becoming the predictable error of seeking good money after bad? After you've stuck with something for a long-term goal for, say, 25 years, mm -hmm. then you don't want to let it go because you've stuck with it for 25 years. Sure. So I'm wondering how you So the question is, I might have a long-term goal for something and I've been spending money on something for 25 years. So you stop and think because the whole sunk costs, it keeps us trapped. And so the trick is to disregard anything that happened in the past, all the investment you made, look forward to the future and say, what do I want in the future? Whether or not you can get this money back, you can back the tw get 25 years back. So in the future, do you want to still have this investment, this thing you're working on? Or do you want to have something different? And so it's the freedom to ask yourself. And so if right now, you know, you think you will want this thing, then just by all means stick with it. If your future does not involve this thing that you've been paying for for 25 years, just let it go. Let it go, because if you don't let it go, you might not be able to get to your future. It might be one or the other. So does that kind of help? So these are not like, you know, written in stone. There are just so many facets to how our minds work, how personalities are set up. We all have different experiences and preferences. And so this is all kind of for us to customize to ourselves. The long-term goal has to be subject to the continual re-evaluation yeah. of information in the situation, whatever has come in, in case it needs to change. Yeah, so we update our beliefs. We evolve our long-term goal. If we wrote our long-term goal 10 years ago, is it still my long-term goal? I don't know. My long-term goal may change next week. So I need to come back to it, you know. So any other questions about this one? So, so this is the last one and we're gonna do a little exercise after this one. And this is a specific strategy for decision making and it's called future scenario method. And so what we do here is we think, you know, we're gonna, you know, some decision we're making what might possibly happen? And we try to imagine the future because you know the future didn't happen yet. We want to predict it, but we can't. So the best we can do is think of what might happen. Possibilities. You know, some possibilities are very likely, some possibilities are very unlikely. We want to just imagine what they might be, especially the ones that are more likely. You know, am I going to be late because I forgot my keys again? Very likely. Am I going to be late because there's a terror attack? you know, in Granville and I can't get home or like next place I'm going, not likely as an example. And then we can kind of prepare and imagine what might happen, especially the undesirable outcomes, the things we don't want to happen. And the reason they have a whole separate a category over here, because it's easy to think of all the good things that might happen. You know, it's easy to think of the positive things, how we're going to succeed. Everything's gonna be great, our friends, our family, our neighbors, you know, we're gonna reach our goals. The undesirable outcomes, nobody wants to think about that. That hurts. Nobody wants to think about that. So let's make an extra effort to think about the bad things that might happen. If the bad things happened, what caused them? How can we prepare? And so now let's use this strategy and go back to some of the things that some of you wrote down about some of the decisions you have coming up and try to brainstorm. 
some possibilities for your decision. What might happen in the future? What do you think is more or less likely to happen? And then imagine what are the bad things that might happen in the future? What might cause them? How can you prevent them right now? So take a few minutes to write those down. Does anybody need paper? Paper, pen, everyone has one? OK, let's take a few minutes to think about those. I think so. OK, good. So what do you guys think? So let's have a discussion about it. Does anybody want to share about the decision they're considering, some of the possibilities you imagined, what you're thinking about? Over there, gentleman in the hat? Can you speak a little louder? Going to graduate school, that's a big one. And uh, some other big um, alternative, which, which one would cause you to leave and regardless, and uh, the highest educational opportunity. Mm -hmm. The biggest is not where the world is for. Say that again, the world. Yeah, I think it's what if uh, uh, a nuclear apocalypse happened? Is that, uh, yeah. So uh, that's like the unlikely. Knowledge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So something that's more likely, you might have to suddenly move out of state. Yeah. Not likely, world will be over. Yeah. Okay. So what do, you, what, what do you think about your decision now that we, we, we had this presentation? Does it change your feeling at all about your decision? Uh huh. Okay. So think more on, on a bigger scale of the whole, of everything else that might be involved. Okay, very good. Does anybody else want to share? Yes? Okay, please. Um, I have to have a pretty intense surgery for all my hips. Uh huh. Uh, that takes about a year to recover from. But I don't know like when to have it because I first found out when I was 17. So it was like, do we do it between high school and college, between college and graduate school? Or Did everyone hear that? Yeah, so that's a huge decision. Yeah. So what, what do you think about some of the, like preparing for the future and planning for the future? I think future-wise it makes most sense to have it now versus when I'm older and there's more likelihood of life getting in the way. <laughs> mm -hmm. So to be prepared for the future yeah. and kind of suck it up. Thanks. Yeah, that's a difficult decision, good luck. Thanks. And it also sounds like what we talked about you know, the hyperbolic discounting where it's hard to plan for the future and to have like such a negative, you know, have a major surgery right now if I don't have to, to prepare for the future that we want. And that's really difficult. So that shows that you're, you're able to try to think beyond that if you feel like it might be better to have it sooner. Just bite the bullet and do it sooner. These are some major decisions you guys are thinking about. Anyone else wants to share? And it doesn't have to be a huge decision. It can be a smaller decision. Yes, please. I'm moving up to the main campus in the fall. I have to decide whether I want to rent or buy a condo. Mm -hmm. which is what I've been looking into. And the rent for the payments for the condo are significantly cheaper. But then you have to wonder, well, what if my house burns down or whatever, and then I'm responsible for it, or, or any number of things. Mm -hmm. So kind of owning or renting for when you're starting, uh, when you're going to Columbus, yeah. That's a big one. So what do you think some of the likely and unlikely possibilities are? Whether it's a safe neighborhood is plays into it a lot, I think. Mm -hmm. But I guess if they're, I mean, my house, my condo will get burnt down, or I'll, someone will beat me up. I don't know. Uh-huh, you don't know. So, we're, so whether it will burn down, we don't know how likely or unlikely it is. But we can also protect ourselves by getting insurance, right? Right. 
we can do that. And you can, you know, safe neighborhood, not safe neighborhood, you can visit, ask your friends. So we can have more of an idea, we can feel the future before we get there, before guessing and, you know, buying our place or renting our place. So, and I think these are the kinds of decisions where it's also, it can be emotional, like, I'm so afraid to move in, you know, a big city, you know, maybe, you know, some people are like, oh, I don't want to go to New York. You know, I, I don't want to live, or in Columbus, you know, it's dangerous, you know, people get shot on the street, but really, do they really like get shot on the street in broad daylight all the time? Or, you know, just every time it happens, we read about it in every newspaper and we see it on TV, so it sounds horrible. But it might be safe. Even in the very blog that someone got shot, it might be a safe street, you know? And so, but it's, we, we have such negative, you know, reactions, the emotions, you know, we're really, like paralyzed. So it's really great to think through all the options. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, please. I'm, I'm not quite sure if that was the whole reference, but basically, like, he, I was like, would you keep investing? So maybe, like, I think they were referencing college, like, you know, because you want to make a lot more money, so you go to college, and the goal is to have a better, more fi like, financially stable life. Well, if, like, you want to apply to, like, a graduate school, but you don't quite have the grades, which doesn't mean, you know, you're not smart, it just means grad schools are, like, super selective, like, you know, like, 2%. Like, there's a 2% acceptance rate into, like, most med schools, which is crazy. So, like, I think the problem that people need to realize is, is they need to set, like, maybe a more reasonable goal with where they are at, are at currently. Because, like, if a med school is only accepting a GPA average of 3.9 and you're 3.4, 3.5, like, it does not mean you're dumb. It just means, you know, you need to reassess where you are. So mm -hmm. that's another thing, like, that might be tangible. So that's very interesting, kind of, if I have a 3.4 average, I want to go to med school, they need a 3.9, so I can feel stupid if I'm 3.4, but 3.4 is pretty good, you know, but also the question is like, why do I want to go to med school? And a little earlier we talked about our attention being drawn, you know, we always pay attention. Before we choose to pay attention, we already pay attention to what's out there. You know, our friends are going to med school, parents tell us that's how we're going to make money, you know, we go to the doctor, you know, they make, you know, they're well off financially. So what tells us that we need to go to med school? What tells us that that's like the main possibility for us? There might be other professional schools. We might not even need to go to graduate school, you know. So we can look at other options. We can look at, you know, where do we have good chances with a 3.4 average? Or maybe some professional schools, for example, you know, they welcome you to have work experience before you apply. So maybe you can, you know, go work out in the business world for, for a few years, and then you would look good, for example, uh, business programs. You look much better with your application if you have worked for a little while in the community. You know. And we can really take control of our future. We can call the admissions office. You know, we can say, come on, like, really, what do you need? What are my chances? If they tell me my chances are poor, I just you know, won't invest all this time applying. You know, sometimes it, you know, we can talk to someone in the professional field and say, what did it take to get here? You know, what do you suggest for me? And they might not suggest graduate school. Maybe they would suggest an internship or, you know, having some kind of a writing or art portfolio or something like that. So there are lots of options out there that, you know, if we just like stay tuned to the media and to kind of what our friends and parents say, we might not be aware of them. We would have to go searching for them. So I think that's a good point, you know, being set on something that's not realistic. Anyone else have any thoughts? Thoughts or questions? Thoughts, questions, comments? OK. Well, thanks very much. Here are those resources again that were mentioned. Some of you signed off to our blog. Did you have another question? I'm sorry. I do have a couple of questions. OK. Um, Dr. Zapensky mentioned earlier that 80% of the decisions you make by, say, system one and intuition uh -huh. are probably going to be fine. Oh, yeah. 20% are wrong. Uh -huh. So you got a statistic for. Now you've done all this homework. You've tried to be self-aware, match the map to the territory. What, what's the success rate of making the good decisions by doing that? Well, the success rate is going to be, like we talked about, like what makes a good decision. Because uh -huh. this is the, the way you're making the decision. Yeah. And what we talked about before, like what's a good decision, the one that I worked hard to make the right way. So, you know. But I, I, I'm yeah. wondering, as I consider my life and, and major decisions that I've made, 
or you know marriage or jobs uh-huh. or career or uh-huh. education. At some point, even after having done all that work, it seems to me that it's my knowledge is still limited. Where yeah, my that, capacity oh, yeah. to know everything and every possibility is still limited. So it requires at some point still a leap of faith, if you will, to make that decision. And not knowing that, yeah, I had all the knowledge I could, but that doesn't mean it's going to end up with a good result yeah. for me in the end. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I think, yeah, I think that I think that if we don't stop and think about it, we're making a leap of faith all the time. Yeah, yeah. I and don't, that I don't mean to just jumping off cliffs. Just yeah, you don't want to just jump off a cliff and hope that you know 80% chance I'm going to survive. Things are going to look <laughs> yeah. good. That's not. Re- but you know, we're not jumping off a cliff every day. We're not jumping off a cliff. Even when we're driving and it's a pretty dangerous situation, we're so good at it. It's mostly system one. It's mostly subconsciously we are, you know, all average drivers not above average. So, but yeah, and, and you're right, and that's... I mean, at some point, you're, you're, it's an informed leap of faith. It's an informed, exactly. <laughs> it's still a leap of faith. Yeah, and we can never be can, 100%, you know. yeah. But you know, but how much better are you gonna feel about yourself knowing that there's a way to improve your decisions? There's a way, like your mind works in a certain way. It doesn't have to be a mystery anymore. It doesn't have to be a mystery. I don't have to just guess like, gee, when do I have to have the surgery? I hate having the surgery or it's terrible. Like, I'm gonna give it my best. And we're not going to do it for all the decisions, but like, yeah, marriage, house, you know, huge decisions in our lives. Like we talked about, we, you know, we pick our battles. And sometimes we really invest into making a good decision. And, you know, it's never going to be 100%. That's the excitement of life, you know, but we, we can give it a good shot. So thanks, everyone, for coming.